Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, your master certified coach and midlife mentor. And I'm so glad to be here with you again for this week's episode, which is all about mermaids and midlife, living your best life after loss with Carmen Mantione. Yes, my friend, I said mermaids. And I have to say, I don't think there have been many times in my life where I've even thought about mermaids. I didn't grow up being fascinated by them, and I never even saw the movie The Little Mermaid. (laughs) I had three boys who didn't show any interest, and, you know, when they were small, it was all about Thomas the Tank Engine and Nintendo. That's what was all in our lives when they were growing up. Now, you may recall that I love whales. I have clicked on lots of mermaid tail jewelry by mistake over the years (laughs) because I thought I was clicking on a whale tail. They look kind of alike. But when I saw today's guest on House Hunters International one night recently, I was transfixed by her story. And her story involves mermaids in a big way, an amazing way, and a way that totally fits with the common themes of the Women in the Middle podcast. Learning how to love your life in midlife, learning how to be more intentional, learning how to dream again and change your mind about what's really possible for you, even now at your age. So my guest today is Carmen Mantione. Carmen suffered a huge loss in her early 40s when her husband died after suffering with an aggressive cancer. She was a widow at 42 and was at a loss as to what to do after his death. She ended up taking a vacation to Mexico that changed her life, and created the space that she needed to process and grieve. Through an interesting opportunity, she ended up having a seed of an idea that involved mermaids. This idea had to do with dreams, and you're totally going to love the story about how Tulum Mermaid was born. Today, Carmen is living her best life in paradise and shares some of her insights about how to move forward in midlife, even when you don't know how to take the first step. So please enjoy this episode. Hi, Carmen. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast. I'm so excited you're here. Hi, Susie. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited also. Oh, my gosh. It doesn't happen that often. In fact, it hasn't happened ever that I've been so smitten with somebody on television. (laughs) With you, it was House Hunters International. It was really late at night. And I was just watching and I'm like, I I need to know her. She's got an amazing story to tell. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Well, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to live, you know, my life, period. And that just happens to be just happens to be my best life. So I'm super excited. I love my life. I love my life. (laughs) That is so amazing because this podcast, Women in the Middle, is all about loving your life. I mean, There's all kinds of things that are going to get in our way uh, pretty much every day. (laughs) and We just have to understand the mindset necessary to pursue a life you love. And you've really done that. And I could tell right away on the episode because it wasn't that easy for you sometimes. So I wonder if we could start there, if you could go back to when you were in your 40s and tell us a little bit about what was going on in your life there, what you were doing for a living and, and what was going on at home. Okay, well, let me start at the kind of the beginning of the end of my old life and the beginning of my new life. Perfect. I, I'm 46 now, so um, this I can't even believe it's only been four years, but I was 42. My husband was much older than me. Uh, he was 22 years older than me, actually. And we had been together for 20 years. And in October of 2017, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he had a very strange type of cancer where it's called cancer of unknown origin. Hmm. The best, yeah. So sometimes they do tests on cancer and they can't figure out what it is and they just kind of throw everything at it. And so the best guess that they could have after uh, a surgery and they did some gene testing on a, a tumor that he had was that he had a, a cancer called mucosal melanoma, which is hmm. the really bad kind of melanoma. 
And so from the day of diagnosis to the day that he died was six months. Oh, oh my God. Six months. And we had, he had, we, we lived out in a town called East Hampton in Long Island. And we were being, he was being treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which was in New York City. So I had to drive basically three hours, well, six hour round trip. Anytime he had a doctor's appointment or wow. a surgery or anything. So that was really difficult. But thankfully, I at the time I, I was a wardrobe stylist. I already had my own business. So I could not worry about like asking for time off or anything. I could just go. And I started waiting tables actually a little bit in the Hamptons because you can make a lot of money and it's super flexible. So I was waiting tables just to bring a little cash in. But my primary job was just taking care of him. And so I did that for six months. I had to lead the family. He was the baby of his family. He, he was one of six. And so everyone, rightfully so, was completely devastated when they were hearing this. And I had some mm-hmm. trouble with, not trouble, but I gained a perspective with caregivers because, you know, you, you kind of it's a very common story where there's one person in the family, usually it's a mother or a father or somebody that's gotten really sick. And there's one person that's really doing all the caregiving. And, you know, then there's always a lot of like family tension and, you know, everyone's like, well, I don't know why you can't just do this. And why can't you just do that? Why can't you do this? And I got a really great perspective on being a caregiver. And I actually had a lot of compassion for the people who are outside the caregiving. Because when I was caregiving for Anthony, I would ask for help, but I had so many structures in place that, you know, and I knew his disease intimately that in order for me to, to communicate that to somebody, it it, it was almost impossible. Yeah. So So it was easier to do yourself. It was easier to do myself Mm -hmm. because if I was away, I would just be worrying. We didn't really know like what was happening and then something would happen. I had a friend come over and just sit with him. And he ended up, he ended up falling Mm. and he was a big dude. So he couldn't get up off the floor, you know, and they had to call. It was just, I felt so bad for the guy who like was just, you know, sitting there watching. I was just like, please just make sure like nothing happens. And if anything happens, call me and something happened and he didn't want to call me. He didn't want to bother me. Mm. So it was super challenging. But what I learned from that was to, I had to live in the moment and I had to live even like a little bit before the moment. Mm. I couldn't really, I didn't have space to space in my head really, because I was taking care of him. I didn't have space in my head to think back to what it was before when he was healthy. And I, I didn't want to think about the future. So I was kind of forced to think like right in that moment. That's Um, so, that's such great perspective. You know, one of the lessons in midlife. It's actually a lesson that it's unfortunate that we don't learn it a lot earlier than we do is Mm. the importance of living in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it is such an important skill and it's something I work on with my clients a lot in coaching is the importance of doing that and why we feel so uncomfortable being in the moment. And here you were kind of forced, but it was probably the thing that made you cope. I mean, I couldn't have coped any other way. I had to, you know, I, I mean, we were we were three or four hours away from all of the family. We mm. lived in a beautiful place, but we were three or four hours away from any family. So I had I had to be the one. And I feel like I stepped into that role with grace and I just did it how I was going to do it. And and also, you know, I I did love being the hero. You know, because I'm one of these overachieving women. <laughs> I could totally tell that from meeting you on television. <laughs> like you, so, you definitely take care of business. Yeah, I needed to. And I felt like, you know, I, I was a wardrobe stylist prior to that. And I was helping my clients. And I really enjoyed that feeling of really, you know, helping them in their lives and really making a a change that was really going to affect them and their confidence and whatever. And so this was the same type of thing. And I remembered a lot of what my mom had gone through just raising, you know, us two and and my brother and myself, and there were some stepbrothers and other things, other people involved, but 
I remember, you know, she had everything so organized. And so I just kind of remembered, all right, all right, it's kind of like being a mom, you know, and I would have the car, I would be able to, uh, I would have the car set up because I knew like what Anthony's symptoms could be, or, you know, every eventuality I had covered. So I had his medicine on one side, I had water bottle on the other side, I had a blanket in the back and everything. And we'd be driving down the LIE and I could like with one hand grab, I had to make sure the car was set up so that I could grab like the thing that he needed. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. It was really intense. It was really intense. And then his, the drugs that he was on made him, I don't know, made him lose it for a little while. And he would get like really high or something. He would perseverate on the buttons in the car. So I'd have to put the child locks on and I would be like, don't touch that button. And he would start touching the button like this button. Don't touch. You mean I'm not supposed to touch that button. And it was so funny and sad at the same time. You know, I was like laughing, crying. It was it was a mess. <laughs> oh, what an intense <laughs> period of your life. And what an identity shift too to go from somebody who was happily married for such a long time and to have such a crisis in such a short period of time. And yeah. it just kind of spits you out the other end. Yes, I remember thinking, well, first I remember thinking I'm my mother's daughter, so I can pretty much handle any shit you throw at me. Yeah. But it opened my eyes to the perspective of some other people like outside of our unit, because we, you know, Anthony and I, we, we had a really great relationship, but like I said, he was 22 years older than me. So I think a lot of people felt that he was really taking care of me and maybe they didn't have the confidence that I would, you know, be able to step up. Because I remember one day I was talking to one family member and Anthony was having these terrible um, fevers. It was, a oh, they were so terrible. But he would get really freezing cold and have to put all the blankets in the house on him and jump on top of him. And then the fever would break and he would sweat. So I know this is kind of maybe gross for your <laughs> listeners. It's real life. That's for it's sure. Real, it's real life. And this is what it is to take care of, of somebody who's who's going through this. I don't think you can really understand it until you actually have gone through it yourself. So everybody, I think you're right. Caregiving for a cancer patient, they'll know what I'm talking about. And maybe they can gain a little perspective on the, from the other side. So anyway, so Anthony would, he would sweat, he would soak the whole bed. And so I'd have to, you know, wash the sheets and change the bed every day. And I remember this one family member thinking that I didn't know how to make the bed that I was getting overwhelmed because I had to make the bed every morning. And mm. I'm like, no, I'm not making the bed. I'm literally changing everything every day. I mean, you know, that takes like 20 minutes and it's like physical work when you're tired and you don't want to do it, but you have to. Yeah. So she was like, oh, now I see. I didn't understand. And, you know, people outside of it, they hear what they want to hear to make themselves feel better. And I understand that. I don't blame them for that because right, it is really hard to imagine what it is. Yeah. And then yeah. what happens? So when I met you hmm? on TV, <laughs> you're my <laughs> new best friend. Um, when I met you, <laughs> you were thinking about your future in at least in terms of moving. So after your husband passed, what was it like for you? How did you get this idea that this kind of a change might be what you want? So I know it's so different than where you were. Yes. Well, after he passed away, um, but well, before Anthony passed away, he told me that I was going to have to sell the house because um, I didn't, I didn't, you know, he owned the house. I didn't really know all of the ins and outs of, of his financial situation. It's such a crazy topic. And I know, um, yeah. You know, you, you definitely were a little at the younger end to be dealing with something like this, although it does happen. It happens to plenty of people. It so happens, yes. it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, there weren't at the time. And I mean, at least in my community, there weren't a lot of 42 year old widows. I didn't think when we met that we would actually fall in love and be together for that long. But we were. What a beautiful story. Had you gone to Mexico together? Is that how? No. No, my, my sister-in-law and my, my brother and sister-in-law spend a lot of time in this area. And after the funeral, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a vacation because also I needed to be out of the house. I'm a very messy person. I just can't help it. This was, <laughs> the, biggest, <laughs> this, 
it's like part of my personality. It's like the biggest, the biggest kind of issue between me and Anthony was that he was a very neat person, like to the point of like combing the, the carpet fringe every day. And I was just like, you know, if I leave shit around the house, I don't even, it's like I have a handicap or a blindness to it. I don't even see it. If I can, you know, I'm not a hoarder, but for sure, like my mother calls it my trail. She's like, Carmen's been here, you know, and I just leave. Things I love out. how you just owned it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm a messy person, yeah. period. I'm a messy person. <laughs> I can't, you know, I, I don't want to change it. Nobody's going to be like, you know, when I'm buried in East Hampton there, they're not going to put on there the messiest girl alive. Well, maybe they will, but. <laughs> No one's going to, you know, that, that doesn't make me a good or a bad person. I'm just a messy person. That's taken a little while for me to process that. <laughs> I'm sure it has. I totally get it. I totally get it. So so what does that have to do with Mexico, though? So I told my my, my brother and sister-in-law that I, I had to take a vacation. My sister-in-law recommended Tulum because while the house was being sold, it's really hard to sell a house in the Hamptons if somebody's still living there. And especially I got it. Like me. People want to feel that it's just, you know, all ready for them to move in. They don't want to see any evidence of anybody living in there. No trails, right? <laughs> no trails. And I can't, I can't help it. So I went, um, I was like, you know, what? I'm going to take a month vacation down in Mexico. They recommended Tulum. I'd never even, I'd never been traveling by myself. I'd never been to Mexico. I didn't know no. outside of Tijuana, but I, I'd never done any of that. So I rented a condo and I was going to stay in Tulum for three weeks and then go to Playa del Carmen for a week, but I didn't really know what to expect at all. And I, I, at the time I, in hindsight, I probably should have found a place on the beach, but it, to me, it felt like it was too expensive, even though I had a, you know, I had some money at the time to spend it, but it just, it just felt like, Oh, I didn't want, you know, I wasn't quite ready to, treat myself luxuriously. Like well, that. of course, you don't know what you're dealing with. I and the know, other I thing, know, I didn't know what I was doing. No, exactly. And you just had a, a tremendous loss. So it's mm-hmm. so hard to think clearly. Mm-hmm. The fact that you even understood that you shouldn't be trying to be someone you're not in a house that's being sold. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> big insight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's one thing. And, and I had such amazing friends and, and my family really stepped up and my, my friends there really stepped up and, and really came together for me and really helped me with that. So, yeah. So she, so my sister-in-law told me that I, you know, she was like, yeah, you know, you're going to go to Tulum for a vacation and you're going to want to stay. <laughs> because, and at the, at that point, Anthony had been gone maybe about a month. I had, a, you know, I had some stuff that I had to figure out. And then I left actually, he died on March 26 or 27 and I left on June 4th. So two months, he'd been gone for about two months. And I was like, okay, um, what am I doing now? You know, <laughs> I, I had no idea, but I figured I could get some clarity. What did you think about your stylist business? Did, did that seem like you just really you knew you needed a break? Or did you think, how am I going to make this work now? Like, what were, what were you thinking about your career, if anything? I wasn't actually really thinking about it. For me, the, I mean, I, I really enjoyed doing it. But it wasn't difficult for me to let it go. And I didn't want to move back to New York City because I didn't know if I could afford it. And honestly, Mm. I didn't know if I wanted to afford it, if I wanted to struggle like that. I didn't know at the time what my financial situation would be. But I thought that I would move back to Florida, which is where I grew up. My mom Mm. is there. My dad is there. My best friend is there. But strangely enough, they... They didn't really, I don't know, I guess I was kind of waiting for them to suggest to me or ask me to come back to Florida and all of them, maybe, maybe they knew I would just reject that idea. I don't know. But I had thought that I was going to go back to Florida, but they, my mom was like, oh yeah, well, can't. I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to come back to Florida, maybe do a road trip, you know, with the dog and my stuff and then see what's kind of happening. And I was like, I'm going, I'm going to move to Mexico. <laughs> So in a way that kind of gave you permission to think outside the box. Yeah, because I didn't really, I didn't have, you know, that safety net. I mean, I'm sure if I got the feeling that after he died and I was in this kind of weird limbo, like people were, they were just watching to see what was going to happen. And I feel like, I, I don't know if this really happens with everybody who's lost somebody like this, you know, because I didn't, we didn't have any children together. Anthony had four kids, but they're all adults. 
I had my dog. I had a career, but I wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult for me to let it go. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I had, um, I had a guest on recently who uh, was also widowed Mm -hmm. um, young and Mm -hmm. um, she was talking about reimagining her career. And I think what she mentioned, and I think what you're getting at is there's some discomfort. People don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to reach out. They love you. They want to help, but you don't know what you want and they don't know what to do. So what you're getting at is this sense that they were kind of watching and maybe they were, maybe they were, you don't know. Right. But I think what's so fascinating is that you thought, oh, going back home may not be the only option. It may not be the thing I have to do for whatever reason. Right. And it kind of just gave you permission to think, hmm, let me think more about Mexico. What did you like about Mexico that it even went into your brain? When I came to Tulum at first, I was here for three or four days and I was going to go home. I was like, fuck this. This is like the worst. Like, I hate this town. But there's some kind of energetic thing that happens here that it tests you. And I hear it. I hear this from many people that this town tests you and then it decides for you if you're going to stay or not. And I know that I know that sounds really weird, but I have seen it many, many times. And I have felt it also like, well, I was like, okay, I came here with wide eyes. I was super excited. I was just going to like do my thing. And then I rented the condo. And then the first in the five, in five minutes, I call them the Tulum fairies. In the first five minutes, I locked myself out of the apartment. I couldn't get back in. Nobody was helping me. And finally somebody did, but I had to wait like two hours for somebody to help me. (laughs) And then there was all these other weird things. I tried to take a yoga class. This girl was kind of mean to me. I tried to get down to the beach and it was like really difficult. And there was all these like kind of obstacles thrown in my way. So I'm like, I'm getting out of here. And then I went to salsa class and then I did some other things. I went on a couple of tours and then everything kind of settled. So you started to meet some more people. I met some people, yeah. Be a little more comfortable with how you could make it a community type of thing. Is that what was happening? Yeah. So I. um, That makes sense. I, so I went to the salsa class. There was a salsa night on the beach road and I was like, oh, yeah, I danced salsa because like a hundred years ago, I made my husband like take take (laughs) lessons with me (laughs) and he was really bad at it but he tried so hard and I learned a little bit and I did some competitions like this was like 20 years ago but it was super fun so I was like yay salsa and then the instructor invited me this is this is the thing that actually happened so the teacher who I didn't actually know was the teacher because I arrived late so they do like a, a free salsa class Uh, beforehand. And then the band comes and everybody dances and it's really beautiful. It's on the beach. It's just like the most incredible experience. Wow. And so this guy came up to me afterwards and he handed me his card and he was like, you know, I'm teaching a bachata class on Wednesday. What's that? Uh (laughs) It is a, it's a, it's a Latin dance. It's related to salsa, but it's much slower and closer and really sensual there's like a lot of body waves and head rolls and stuff you Mm. should take a look for it it's really beautiful as opposed to salsa so and and that's what I said to him like I I don't know what you're talking about but all right you know (laughs) whatever here I am I'm like what am I gonna do so he ended up picking me up uh to take me to this to the bachata class and then afterwards he was like yeah well we can dance salsa afterwards if you want la 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 And that's when I kind of decided, I think I was here for about 10 days. That's when I kind of decided that, oh yeah, I could make a life because this class had all kinds of people in it. So I thought it was like going to be at a hotel or something, but it was actually at a community center. And he was giving this class for pretty cheap. And there was like all kinds of people that looked like me. There was, you know, gringas and Europeans and Canadians and local Mexicans. And I mean, so there was like a lot of people here and I could see that they were all like, you know, working and making their life. So that kind of kind of pushed me over the edge for that. Yeah, that's so great because really you were sensing community and that you could belong there, right? And I see that a lot uh, with midlife women that community is often an overlooked part of happiness. 
your mm-hmm. connection to community mm-hmm. um, in terms of relationships, but it can be very rewarding and very fulfilling. And it's something that you can have a fair bit of control about too, because you can put yourself in lots of different situations and settings to meet people. And, um, and that's kind of what was happening here. So all of a sudden you were like, oh, this is real life. There right. are real people yeah. and I fit in. Yes. Oh, and, and I love that. Yeah. And they were all kind of like me, just, kind, you know, I mean, they weren't all widows, but every, everyone who, who's come here has had some kind of break, hmm. a lot of divorce, a lot of big, you know, uh, heavy breakups um, after many years. Uh, usually that's what it is. Somebody I met, like, had lost her business in a fire. So wow. they're all, you know, we're all kind of trying to heal ourselves from, from that. And, and this town... These are things I didn't know about this town when I came here, but it attracts people like me who are looking for something new. There's a different type of person coming now. But at the time when I came three, three and a half years ago, there was a lot of women, especially men too, but a lot of women who were coming, who were like looking for the, that next thing they're looking. Okay. For it. So that's, that is fascinating. So what I saw on the TV show was uh-huh. that you described um, this opportunity that came up where a restaurant was looking for some entertainment. Mm-hmm. Tell me how that happened and how and how you showed up. OK, so first it was a friend of a friend. So I take pole dancing classes here. <laughs> you love to dance. I do. I love to use my I love to move. I hate exercising, but I do love to move. So um a girl that was in the pole dancing class, she was a a friend of of this person and she was doing their social media and she had put out on social media that like, yeah, you know, we're looking for entertainers because we have this restaurant in the jungle, there's a pool. So if you're a belly dancer or some type of, you know, kind of nighttime entertainment, if you're a mermaid, we've got a pool, whatever. And I was like, oh, I'm a mermaid because I had bought I had taken a class. I don't know if she's actually giving the classes anymore, but I had taken like a mermaid class and I had bought the fin. Now, wait a minute. Where did you take a mermaid class? I took a mermaid class here in Tulum. Was it just like salsa or you were like, oh, I've always loved mermaids like I love whales? Well, no, I I didn't think I really loved either one of them. Interesting. I was looking at searching around Instagram, I think at that time and... I don't know. Wiki Wachi. Do you know Wiki Wachi? I do not. Wiki Wachi is a theme park in Florida that has an underwater theater and they do mermaid shows. Oh, and have they, you been there? Yes. I used to go. I grew up down there. So I used to go there every year and I actually went to the mermaid camp a couple of years ago and met all the mermaids. It was like the highlight of my life. A mermaid so, camp. OK, I, it never yeah. occurred to me that there was a mermaid camp. Look what mermaid I'm learning. For grown up, <laughs> yes. So you um, had this in your back pocket. And now you see mermaid on a job posting, really? Yes, exactly. Because my because my friend and I were like, oh, yeah, we should go to mermaid camp. I'm like, yes, let's go. And then I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe there's a mermaid experience here in Tulum. And there was a girl doing it. I don't know uh, really what she's doing now, but I had kind of a difficult time getting in touch with her. And she took me to the cenote. And that was like my first uh, kind of mermaid ever experience swimming with the fin. And I just had it just to play with. And then. My friend told me they were, you know, they were doing these open auditions at this restaurant for mermaids. And did I want to come? And well, I had suggested to her, I'm like, you know, I have a mermaid fin. I could come and like, you know, mermaid around. And she's like, that's something that that's something I would never say. Oh, I have a mermaid. fin." (laughs) I know. And as I'm and I'm as I'm talking to her, as I'm telling her about it, I'm like, I can't believe I'm I'm like saying this, but I want to, you know, it would be really cool to be a professional mermaid. And why not? Like I, at this point, I'm just kind of saying yes to every single thing that comes into my life. Because I've realized that there are very few decisions that you can't negate, you know, that you mm-hmm. can't make up for. You know, what did I care? So I was really starting to try to get into the community. At that point, I was hosting. I had like a clothing swap at my house, which is something that nobody had ever heard of. So we had a really fun time. Yeah. And um, one of the girls there was helping me make a tail and it it didn't end up working. So I had to go. I had to like YouTube. I literally I YouTube like how to make a, a mermaid tail. And I have my sewing machine here because, you know, I was a wardrobe stylist and costume designer and I like sewed one up. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> I, had to go, I had to travel like an hour to get the fabric because there's nothing here in, in Tulum, but I went to Playa del Carmen. I bought the fabric and then I like just showed up 
uh, Saturday night in this, you know, uh, at this restaurant in like full mermaid with like eyes and jewelry and the tail. And she was like, all right, get in the pool. Let's see what you can do. And I'm like, oh my God. I, and like, shit. I'm like, <laughs> okay. What did the You're pool look like-, like? Was it an in-ground pool or was it like a, a it was tank? A, it's an in-ground pool. And then around it on the patio surrounding the pool is um, our tables for, for dinner. Wow. Okay. So, you know, the entertainment. And I had never really been paid like to do any kind of entertainment as a, an artist or an entertainer. So I get in there and I'm like, well, all right, you know, and, if, and, and P.S. I'm 40 at that time. I was 43 or 44 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe I'm playing at mermaids. Okay. Whatever. To me, what's striking me is that you said yes to everything. Uh huh. That everything makes sense. You love to move. You hate exercise. You love dance. You were a stylist. You had a sewing machine. You know about fabrics and wardrobes. You you went to a mermaid camp. It seems like you've been training to be a professional mermaid your whole life. Possibly. (laughs) Possibly. I, I feel like now that I run the tours, I feel like I get a lot of people who feel the same way. Wow. And they just never knew it was possible. So anyway, so I was there and I was splashing around, you know, and I was and, and interacting with the guests and I became Princess Starfinia. That's my mermaid name. And I get out of the pool, the owner of the restaurant, she was like, well, you know, you're like the best mermaid I've ever seen. And I was like, what are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I never even swam in a tail before. That was my first time. I just, <gasps> I just had the fin. I didn't actually have the tail. So the, it comes in two parts. It's a, a tail skin and the monofin. So, so the I, monofin is just the little fin thing at your feet? Yes. Oh, and the tail is what you see in images, like the whole yes. getup. The whole thing, right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So that was the first time you slid <laughs> yeah. into the pool and splashed around with it? <laughs> and uh, so she was like, yeah, you're hired. You can come back. And then it ended up she closed the restaurant before I could actually uh, work there. Oh. But then, yeah. But then I was like calling my friends and I was like, guess what? I'm a professional mermaid now. Like, okay, whatever. <laughs> they were like, of course you are. <laughs> I'm like, I need a name. So they helped me come up with a name. And then, well, hang on uh, a minute. Hang on a minute. So uh, now it was in your brain. So now yeah. you wanted to be a professional mermaid. Yeah. And I thought that I would just be like, okay, I'm going to make this tale. I'm going to tell some people that I'm, you know, a mermaid and I'm just going to go like swim in the pool and, you know, make a million dollars. I don't know. (laughs) So how did you go from, I think I'm into being a mermaid to creating an actual business, being a mermaid and, and sharing the love? Well, this is something that I had spent about a year and a half, I guess, just kind of adjusting to everything, you know, learning salsa. And also I'm taking Spanish lessons because I moved to a new freaking country. <laughs> <laughs> so every day is like a learning experience. Oh my God. I mean, I'd still like that, but now I'm a little bit more used to it. But at some point, at s- sometimes I was like, can I please just like not learn anything today? Like, I just, <laughs> like, thank God there's Netflix here and they show most of the shows that I really like and they're in English because, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because just adjusting to life here in general is difficult. So I started, I started telling people that, yeah, like I'm going to be a professional mermaid, you know, like, I don't know. I just started telling people that I didn't know anything. And a few of my friends were like, since you can make the tales, you should, you know, offer tours. And I'm like, oh no, that sounds like a lot of work. I don't know what that needs. You know, what do I need? Blah, blah, blah. And it just kind of happened really naturally. I had a friend who could make my first batch of tales. I did a lot of research on the fins and then I created a, a program and then we launched in December, I think of 2018 or 2019. I forget. We're going to have our three year anniversary in 2021. So I think 18, 19, 20, 2018, I, I guess. Right. I 19, 2018. 20. Yeah. You know what happens is the the pandemic is really messing with us. I, I have. Yeah. It's a I complete all of 2020. Yeah. It's a complete inability to remember time. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like it was 2018, December. Yeah, that's what I think. I I have to look back at the Instagram, but I just like kind of came up with a program. I mean, one of the things that I'm really lucky here right now is that a lot of things are not regulated. And we have these beautiful cenotes that um, that are in the States. We call them natural springs. 
but they're literally like sinkholes. So all of Tulum is, is settled on a, a bed of limestone. And in certain places, the limestone is very porous and they've sunk. Uh, so, and then they make these big pools of water. Some of them are big, some of them are small and they're all connected. The water is all connected. This is where we get all our water from uh, in the area. It's very similar to Florida, which is part of the reason that at least the, the part of Florida that I grew up in. Well, I have to say on your Instagram, the photography is stunning. Thank you. It's yeah, we've been working. Stunning. It's hard. It's hard to take a bad picture of a mermaid, first of all. <laughs> but I have been working with some really talented people who just love taking pictures of mermaids. And, and I've, I've been really lucky. Yeah. Well, it's not We're it's not just that. It's not just that the tails and the mermaids themselves, like every you're right. I think a tail could make anybody look beautiful, but it's the water. Like there was something magical about the underwater shots. And Mm -hmm. until you just said natural springs, like I didn't know where I don't know anything about the area, but there's something particularly magical about the experience you're offering. So you came up with the idea. To me, it seems obvious that you found yourself in this position because everything in your <laughs> life has led up to this. It, it really does. It really does feel that way. I mean, I just kept saying yes. And then, and then, you know, I, I kept saying yes. And then when this opportunity came, I was just like, well, why not? I need to do something. Yeah. And again, if you weren't, if you hadn't made this shift, it's hard to imagine leaning into something that's unknown that's like so creative and different, you know, imagine yourself in your old life in the Hamptons. Would, would anything this unconventional pop into your mind? You know, I don't know. Well, I did have a lot of unconventional ideas that didn't actually take off. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But I think the big thing in the States was that, you know, in order, if you have an idea, it's, it's very difficult to start with very little money. You really do need money. And I had a couple of ideas. I tried to get some business loans. I tried to get some investors and it just, just didn't happen for me. And that's fascinating. Yeah. I just, you know, kept trying. So I I find that like here, at least in Tulum and in Mexico in general, because the lifestyle here in Tulum, the lifestyle is expensive. It depends on how you want to live. But for me, I had, you know, my, my husband left me some money and I have a brilliant financial advisor who make sure that I'm taking care of every month. And it's not a lot, but it does re- take the pressure off so that I could f- feel like there was no pressure for me to actually start this business because I didn't need to worry about paying my rent next month. You know, no, like I love that. I, I love that you were very careful about the lifestyle that you chose that allowed you to be a little bit experimental and start small. And even that decision and understanding is that maybe this idea won't work in this place, but maybe I can make it work in another place. Like I have a lot of clients who get stuck only thinking about a possibility in one way. Mm -hmm. And really, you can just change the way you think about it to make it more possible. And it sounds like that's what you did kind of organically. Like you had this passion you saw the job posting, then everything started to happen. Then you imagined yourself being a professional mermaid. Yes. And it's like, okay, I need to source this. I need to source that. And you started small. And I just yes. love that. So what does, the, what does it look like? If I were to sign up for your adventure, what would it be like? Well, the first thing we do, is the, the tour lasts about three and a half to four hours, depending And before I see you, before I ever see you, I find out what your sizes are, what your favorite colors are, what your level of swimming is. And also we offer snacks. So I always make sure, you know, if you have any food allergies, some people have some really weird things. Sometimes it's not just granola bars and cucumber juice, you know, it's something else. Lots of food sensitivities and things that they want for their perfect experience. Dietary restrictions. So we meet at a, at a place in town and I pick everybody up. And, and the first thing that uh, you see for Tulum Mermaid is me. And I'm always in full on like Tulum Mermaid. I've got my crown. I've got my scales. I've got my like matching little outfit and my sign. So that everybody, you know, first of all, that's good marketing. But so that from the minute that you begin the experience, it begins before you even get in the van. So how gonna- are you driving with your tail? <laughs> I have a guy driving. Oh, I have okay. A, we have a taxi driver. We have two official ones: a, a, a taxi and a van. 
you know, it's um, funny because I saw in some of your testimonials that people love the pickup, like you're making a splash, no pun intended, yeah. but like even yeah. when, when like right away, people were loving even yeah. being picked up. Yeah. And I, that's what I want. I want you to drop down into that fantasy, you know, at ground zero at, 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 at minute one. So I send them to, I, we pick up at my, it's my favorite bar, but they happen to serve coffee also in there in the morning. So you can go, you can have a coffee, get ready. There's always like live music going there. It's really like a, a very special place. And then I show up in full mermaid and then you're having, you know, you are already a mermaid. So it already gets you into the, to the attitude that you're a mermaid. So then we take you in the van and go to the cenote and then it's, it's about 10, 15 minutes. So on the way, everybody gets their mermaid name. And I have like a little mermaid name generator. If you're having problems and some people have it in their head already, what they want to be. What's a mermaid name? Like what would my name be? Is it just something I like, or is it it yourself? (laughs) Do people usually go with alliterations or they go with, a, uh, it, it really depends. I mean, I have a paper that has like a bunch of different names that you can kind of put together or just get some inspiration. You know, and people will be like, well, I really like the sea or I really like starfish. And then so we'll name you maybe like, I don't know, starry sea or mermaid uh, wave runner or, you know, sometimes people get really silly and sometimes people really enjoy their name. Opalina was one I remember. And Oh my gosh. That's, I love Opalina. I I think that's great. (laughs) So, so then you get your mermaid name because as soon as you get into the van, we're, we're transforming. So this is part of the, the experience I want to give you is that it's a, it's a complete transformation from human to magical sea creature. And we also go over the mermaid code, uh, which is just very simple. There's just three. It's uh, mermaids always lead, uh, Tulum mermaids always lead with love. And that's first love for ourselves and then love for others, love for the environment, et cetera. Tulum mermaids always respect the environment. So we take only pictures. We leave only footprints. The third one is Tulum mermaids always swim with safety first. Mm. You know, it is an amazing experience, but I have a PADI certified mermaid certifi- uh, instructor certification. I'm actually the first one in the world that, uh, that received the certification. Mm. Uh, And it is, you know, you're swimming. So, and you're swimming unlike anything you've ever done. So there is definitely, and the the fins, if you're not aware of your fin, because it's basically it's added a meter or more to your feet, you can really hurt somebody or damage the cenote or something. So we always do that. So then we arrive at the cenote and um, everyone gets their tails on. I do a little demo and then we jump in and we start swimming. So you've got the photographer there as well? No, what I usually do is um, most, most of those, a lot of the photos are taken actually just like on the iPhone. Um, And if somebody, well, uh, some of them are, and then some of them, if you want to hire a professional photographer, I offer professional photography uh, styled, you know, super styled photography packages as well. But, and then all the underwater stuff is usually, is just, is usually me and the GoPro. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. So Uh, are you finding um, people of all ages like this? Yes, I am. I've had, I've had mermaids as young as three. And I think maybe my oldest mermaid was somebody's grandmother around 70 or a little bit older, but if you can swim, you can do this. Yeah. Wow. And one thing I noticed on your website, like bridal parties are doing this. Yes, we do have, uh, we have a lot of bachelorette parties. We have birthday parties and then we have just a lot of individuals. I mean, I did one recently. I don't know if you saw the post, but um, a friend of mine brought her sister and daughter and she called herself Thelma and Louise. They call them. (laughs) So we did a whole thing about like, I did a whole video on like, what really happened to Thelma and Louise after they went off the, after they Deep went off the, the, cliff, the cliff as they turned into mermaids. So that is that. hilarious. I think this would be a great 50th or 60th birthday present too. It, it is a great, you know, many of my, I, I was looking on my Instagram, the, the graph, the, the graphics, I don't know, whatever that's called the analytics. Um, my, my group is between 25 and 44 with like 35 to 44 being like, you know, the main interest. But I feel like 
women, you know, in their forties and fifties can be more transformational experience for them. Yeah. It's very playful. And one of the things that's really important is to open your mind to more play, more pleasure, uh, making sure that you do what it is you want to do with intention and to be guided like this by somebody who's really putting your money where your tail is, right? Like you're really, (laughs) yeah, I really am. And I feel like, you know, I've had people get into the tails and start crying because they have really wanted it so much. And so I always tell people, because sometimes people will come and, you know, they'll just be like humoring the other person. They'll be like maybe a couple or a couple of people. And like, for instance, the Thelma and Louise, they really just wanted to go with the niece and they didn't realize that they would, they would love it so much. It's fascinating. I mean, having a chance to dress up like that is very unusual to wear yeah. costumes. Swimming can be so freeing. And, yeah. and this transformation that you're talking about, I mean, you've personally had such a huge transformation, which is why right. I was so attracted to your story <laughs> with you. your personal life and how difficult that experience was. And then how it allowed you, though, to open yourself up and to think about what you might want to do next. And then yeah. to have such an idea that's so playful and so entrepreneurial to change countries. Like it's great. I love, I love your story, Carmen. It takes a lot of nerve, a lot of courage. Yes. Um, I, you know, I suppose so, but I didn't really feel like that when it was happening. And I think that's maybe the secret that why I'm like quite happy right now is that I just kind of let things come and I, I've taken all the pressure off. I don't have a lot of, you know, I don't have the kids or a house or a you know, career. I mean, I have those things, but I don't place serious importance on them. So I feel like that's maybe one of the secrets to, to really changing your life. It, you know, I'm so new, glad you said that. And, pressure. Yeah. So that's so important. And, and one of the things that comes up a lot on the podcast with guests and also with my clients is people want to figure out a solution and they want to have all the steps mapped out. Uh-huh. They want certainty, right? They want to guarantee that if they make this transformation, if they invite this change, Mm -hmm. then they have to know exactly what's going to happen. Right. Right. According to a timeline too. And I think what your experience is and what you're saying is that that creates a lot of pressure. Yeah. And it's impossible. Like, how are you going to know what's going to happen when you say yes to one thing and you meet other people and, and then more opportunities come up and it's impossible to know what you don't know. It's impossible. And I mean, I, I just have never been one of those people. I mean, I've worked with coaches who like have made me put like, you know, timelines and goals and all that other shit. And it just doesn't, I, I'm so happy if it works for somebody else, but me, I'm just like, I never do it. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a brilliant procrastinator. I'm so good at it. But also I've realized that I'm, I was thinking about this before, like I procrastinate, but it's just because I'm just kind of waiting for the perfect time. Well, you mentioned that you really care about your intuition and trusting yourself too. And I think that's part of that. What is the perfect time? What's perfect for you is when you, when you have that reading within yourself, like you're connecting to something with yourself that's helping you make these decisions. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. And I also, I also feel like it should be easy. I I feel like, you know, forcing yourself to do stuff based on because, you you know, maybe you think you're feeling pressure to change your life, but maybe you're happy in your life and you don't realize that either. But you see other people like, you know, with career and kids and all the other stuff and you feel like, well, maybe you should be living on the beach in Tulum. Like, well, maybe you should. But, you know, (laughs) but what you're bringing up is perfect because we tend to think that change is hard. Right. And what if we got the memo wrong? What if change is easier than you think? Yeah. You know, we spend so much time thinking that thought that it's hard. It's going to be hard. Uncertainty is hard. And then that creates all these feelings that are so difficult. But what if change was easy the way you're the way you're talking about it? I mean, it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. And, and I was I was quite happy in my life before, you know, before Anthony died. And I kind of knew I mean, he we had some differences in that he didn't understand, you know, like we had a big argument once I, I tried something and it didn't work and he got really angry with me and I try and, and I was crying and I was trying to explain to him. I'm like, but the trying of it is the success of the thing. 
Right. And he didn't understand that because I don't know, because he was older than me, because that was just the way. So well, a lot of people don't believe that failure is an opportunity to right. learn. A lot of people think failure right. is failure. Right. But you probably are successful now <laughs> because of, of what you learned during that experience. I'm sure that yeah. had something to do with it. Yeah, I really, you know, and I, I try things here with the mermaids and sometimes this stuff works and sometimes it doesn't. And yeah, I, I don't like to be wrong, but it's OK. <laughs> yeah, it's OK. Exactly. Yeah. I've, I've learned to really like accept and forgive myself and just be like, all right, you know, like it's OK, like feel what you're feeling. And then eventually when the time is right, this is also the thing. I just trust like the universe and myself and all this. When the time is right, the changes will happen because I'll know when that time is. Carmen, I love it. I mean, really, your messages are coming out loud and clear that you really uh, you were always on the right path. It just took you a bit of a change of environment, maybe to see how it could all come together. And that this pressure that things could be easy, it doesn't have to be difficult and to trust yourself more. And then also (laughs) remember that when you're wearing a mermaid tail, your sense of space may a little be a little bit off. That's a good lesson too. <laughs> it's good. I invite you to come down. You come as my guest. You'll see how amazing it really is. Oh my gosh! Well, that's like what I was just going to ask you: is fantasy. how can people how can people learn more about the experience? How can they find you? Well, they can find me on Instagram, Tulum Mermaid, and then also our website, TulumMermaid.com. Fantastic, Carmen. It was absolutely. Lovely to meet you. I don't often get a chance to talk to somebody who is a professional mermaid. I would say never. I have never had that chance. <laughs> Thank and you I so just, much. It's been a pleasure to repeat my story. I, I, I hope. Um, I oh hope my I gosh! Help help somebody in some small way. You will because it's just you allowed yourself to think out of the box, and you allowed yourself the grace to take the first step, and that right. that is really what it's all about when it comes to being intentional. And growth. I mean, you grew. Yes. And even easy. in the thing is easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't have to be as hard as you think. Well, um, I it, it's just so funny because I love whales so much. I'm often attracted to mermaid jewelry because it looks like whales um, mm-hmm. from afar, or it's just the tail. So I don't know. Now you may have inspired me. I may need to be Princess Abalone or something like that. Oh. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you may be seeing me in Tulum. I don't know. Crazier yeah, things so. have happened. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks so much, Carmen. All, right, All the best for having me, Susie. Take care. OK, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed meeting Carmen. I don't know about you, but I can't stop thinking about mermaids. <laughs> now, Carmen went through a lot. She really did. And She didn't know what she wanted to do after her husband died, but she decided to just let things come when she made her move to Mexico. Now, this lesson is huge. So many of us midlife gals, we want to know the exact details related to a change, and this creates a ton of stress and overwhelm. Many podcast guests have talked about how important it was for them to take one step forward and believe in the journey rather than waiting until all of the steps were clearly defined to take the first step. Carmen also talked about this strategy when the idea for Tulum Mermaid came to her. She was really excited and so excited that she took the first step. Again, she just let it come. She didn't have a big overwhelming plan. She just let the next step reveal itself. Now, what does this idea bring up for you? Are you stuck because you don't know all the details related to a change you're considering? Have you even been able to do this? Have you ever done something when you didn't have all the gory details worked out? And if not, are you actually waiting now until you have a big plan developed to take the first step? It's so interesting. If you're stuck because of this, you really have to ask yourself why. What do you make planning this way mean to you? Do you know what you might be afraid of? And if you're stuck and not moving forward, are you ready to consider a different plan forward? And here's a question I love. What would love itself, what would love do to help you figure it all out? These are all great questions to help you help yourself if you're feeling stuck. You never know. It might be time for a mermaid experience of your own to shake up your perspective. 
All right. As you know, my focus as a midlife coach is to help you waste less time spinning and feeling stuck about aging, empty nest, relationships, your career, and even about learning how to finally put yourself first. It's time to get excited about your life again. Remember what I always say, being the queen of your brain domain is the best way to be, and I am here to help. This is what you'll learn when you hire me as your coach. Learning the mindfulness concepts are one thing, but when it comes to applying the concepts, that's when you really benefit from coaching. And that's why you should really join the Finally First Club. We are waiting for you. It's my monthly midlife membership that's your one-stop home away from home for coaching, community, and connection. You can finally get that fresh perspective, learning and growing in a community of like-minded women that will help you sail into your next chapter with more confidence, creativity, and happiness. The best really is yet to come. It really is. So join us now at www.iamfinallyfirst.com. For show notes and links, head over to www.coachwithsusie.com. And to get a copy of my new book, 50 Ways to Celebrate Life After 50, check out Amazon or your favorite online bookseller or go to www.50waystocelebrate.com. Let's do this, ladies. It's time for you to put yourself first, one thought at a time. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye.